Brokering success demands a battle-ready strategy. Thai TMS equips brokers with the ultimate battle station for conquering a tough market. With Thai, brokers gain access to a comprehensive platform where rate intelligence and quote history coverage on a single screen. Revolutionize the way your brokers perform by giving them a competitive advantage with Thai TMS. For more info, visit thaisoftware.com slash battlestation. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call. Today we're covering all things data security. Don't forget to subscribe to Check Call the newsletter on FreightWaves.com if you haven't already. Today we welcome the one and only North Windship, president at Shiplify. Welcome to the show, North. Thanks for having me, Mary. I'm excited to get into today because data security is, it's not like the most exciting topic, But it is something that is going to become more and more prevalent kind of as we get into this very technology heavy future. But before we get too far into that, let's get some background on you and how you got started at Shiplify. Well, I um, I actually I graduated from college in 2013 and I had a decision to make. I could either uh, come out of college and go hit the workforce and look for an actual job or I could tag along with my dad who was getting Shiplify up and running right off the bat. And I kind of opted for, uh, for option two. And, uh, and I decided it was, it was time for me to learn a little bit about LTL and, and curating some data sets and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how I got into this. Um, and yeah, the rest is, is history. I like it. Um, but also as someone who has also learned LTL in the past, that's a, that's quite an undertaking to take on because, um, no matter what in the the universities and college, they really just kind of gloss over, um, LTL and really just kind of go, you'll figure it out because who actually knows who actually knows, but it's one of those that once you're in it, you're like, this is, this is a choice that we are making. Yep. He, uh, you know, I was actually an advertising major and my dad was like, okay, well, now that you've graduated, your education can actually start. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, and he was right, you know, so, um, but now, you know, here at, at Shiplify, just giving you a, a brief background of, of our company a little bit, we are a location data provider specifically for the LTL industry. So, We've curated these data sets and slapped some algorithms on on top of them um, where we really help carriers and and shippers and 3PLs identify um, accessorial related locations like residential locations, you know, places that don't have docks or forklifts, they're likely going to need a lift gate and limited access locations. Um, and I know a lot of that kind of leads to headaches all throughout the ecosystem. Um, and hopefully we can uh, bring an element of, of visibility and accuracy and um, consistency. The fact that you guys have a, 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 an actual like technological solution for that is great um, because back in my day, we, <laughs> we just looked it up on Google and did the satellite view. And if it looked like it wasn't a dock, then we're like, okay, that's limited access or residential delivery. Um, but just looking up each individual address is a nightmare. So I'm glad that you guys have that solution. You know, we do, we do plenty of that here today, every single day. Um, we've got teams of people kind of going in and, and doing that exact thing, but you know, really, We've kind of we've got a solution that that provides a a really significant amount of coverage that allows kind of anybody within the industry to to really automate on this and automate with truly accurate information. Um, And and the fact that we're working with shippers and 3PLs and carriers, it really kind of allows them to access the same database um, and the same data source um, and get aligned on some of this thing. so that's, that's been well received kind of on both sides. That's gotta be uh, I don't know. I kind of like that part because you're only as, like you said, like everybody says, you're only as strong as your weakest link, but if a whole bunch of people are feeding into it, then that's how, you know, you're getting kind of like the most accurate data possible. Um, but now that we're jumping, now that we've covered our databases, 
Oh, that's a funny joke that I just made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of Mary's sad puns. Um, so you mentioned that since you guys are a data provider, you have shippers, carriers, 3PLs, et cetera, using your, um, kind of using the data you have. What are some of those responsibilities as a data provider that you have to kind of make sure that you do have that data quality and that it is consistent regardless of if you're a shipper, a carrier, anyone that you basically are providing the most consistent and, um, you know, accurate data? Yeah. You know, for, from really the way that we look at, at, at some of that, we, we basically say, okay, well, what are our responsibilities as a data provider? It really kind of starts with, with accuracy, because if you're not going to be in business very long, if you are a data provider and you're, you're flowing out bad and inaccurate information into the ecosystem and into the network. So that's our, really our, our core business is built on the ability to take bad data in and output clean, consistent, and accurate information. So, regardless of how the data is structured, and you know, as long as as long as we can kind of get the information that that we need, we have a, a very sophisticated suite of strategies and and that sort of thing that can kind of cleanse that data, normalize it, and spit out the information that that our customers are kind of coming to us for. Um, and and so that's that's really kind of a, a key pillar of what we view as as one of our responsibilities. So we have data quality teams that you know we we really invest in that. We're constantly scouring our database, looking for for bad data or anomalies in the data, things like that. And we're constantly cleansing that and making sure we 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 really provide the the maintenance of that data. You know, a lot of times there's there's something that was an old house that's been knocked down and now it's a dollar general and it's no longer residential. We've got to go find those things, keep those up to date, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then we also have feedback loops in place with our customers. So if we flow bad data out into the marketplace, um, they can essentially notify us of that bad data and we get that cleaned up within 24 hours. Because the last thing we want to do is put bad data out there do that consistently over and over and then not give somebody the ability to to notify us that hey this is incorrect and then at least you know we're we're very well familiar with the problems that if we provide bad data into the industry um all of our customers and their customers are extremely unhappy and it leads to margin erosion on the on the shipper side because we said this is is a limited access location and it's and it's actually not and the carrier applies an accessorial fee incorrectly and maybe the maybe the shipper um identifies that or maybe they don't um and then on on the carrier side they're having to field the dispute call and um you know go through this whole review process on their end so so we take data accuracy very very seriously here at shipify um and and we we really kind of look into every opportunity that we have along the way to cleanse the data and make sure it's it's accurate. Um, and with a high degree of accuracy, you're then able to take some of that data that you have and feed it into some machine learning algorithms. And then that can spit out very highly accurate predictions and you can start to capitalize on that. But if you have bad data coming in, and you're training those models on bad data, then you're going to get bad outputs, and that's going to lead to headaches throughout kind of at least our little niche portion of the of the supply chain. Um, and then, and then the other things that we kind of look at in terms of responsibilities as a uh, as a data provider is a you need to make that data accessible to your customers, and you need to be able to to go meet them where they are from a, from a technology standpoint. Um, so if they can't access that data, regardless of how accurate it is, you're not, we're, we're not really doing our job at that point, you know? It's, and so we need to maintain, you know, high levels of uptime. Um, we need to give various different API endpoints. We, we need to give, you know, okay, I wanna go look something up in Shiplify's database, you know, that, that's available as well. 
and then you know somebody wants to submit an RFP bid or send us a batch file or something like that, we we've, we've got the functionality to handle that as well. So accessibility is another another piece of that. Um, and then obviously you've kind of got data privacy and, and data security um, as a responsibility as a as a data provider as well. Um, those things kind of go hand in hand. Um, the security is obviously top of mind um, for us and really anybody that's managing any sort of data. You know, you hear about ransomware attacks and you hear about um, all sort of all sorts of data breaches, whether it's in our industry or just in the in the news. Um, and so, you know, we're doing everything that we can in order to maintain that that our data is secure, um, both from an application standpoint and kind of an internal policy standpoint, um, making sure that, that you know, we, we're remaining SOC 2 compliant or ISO compliant, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and, and in order to be able to say, you know, we, we are adhering to, you know, industry standards um, from a from a standpoint of data security. Um, and then with the privacy standpoint, um, you, you're really, it's the data privacy thing is more com being compliant with state regulations. Um, you know, we don't really do anything um, over in Europe. So we don't have to adhere too, too much to the GDPR standards and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, but we have those, you know, top of mind as well. Um, but then, you know, each and every state really kind of has, um, are, are starting to follow um, in California's footsteps and, and get some of these data privacy um, regulations out there. And, and they're starting to, to gain some traction with approval there. So, it, you know, it, those are kind of the four main things. I know I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, uh, but accuracy accessibility and then privacy and security that's those are the things that we're really looking at as a as a response our responsibilities as a data provider so i guess when it comes to like you said some of those other states are looking at adopting that california data privacy or something similar how do you guys have you found like the what's the best way to keep up with all of these changes and kind of know what is a rule that's going into effect versus like what might be held up in potentially like a, a court situation? How do you how do you guys basically stay on top of all these changes? The first thing is find somebody smarter than you and and basically assign them to that and and make sure that they are kind of staying on top of that. So you know, we, we've got someone here who's, who's constantly scouring that. Um, you can you can always consult with your general counsel or, or attorneys, anything like that. They should hopefully be, be staying on top of some of that, particularly if you're dealing with PII information or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's it's staying on top of it, checking in, making sure you're you're reviewing your existing agreements with your customers you're adhering to some of those compliance standards within the states and then essentially making sure if there are changes made from a state by state basis, you remain in compliance and in terms of what you're doing with, with data and, and what you're not. And really, if you're not being slimy with data, hope, hopefully you're, you're in good standards, you know, or in good standing with, with the states. Um, you know, if, if you're, we kind of, the way we kind of look at it is if it, if it feels slimy, it probably is. Don't, don't do it, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of our stance on that. I like that. If it, if you feel like you have to go take a shower afterwards, then, or if it makes you go, Ooh, then maybe that's not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just, you know, so just don't do it, you know? So I guess I'll, I'll like, Basic coming off of you've you touched on kind of the rise of ransomware and other security threats and then also you know not being slimy and gross with other people's data um what are some of those risks that you you know shippers carriers 3pls etc go through that or what are those potential risks that they face if they don't prioritize their own data quality or their own security within an organization so if that's partnering with 
less than desirable vendors that they thought were on the up and up or, um, you know, not necessarily having strong security measures in place. What are some of those risks? Is it truly just, you know, you're going to get hacked easier or is it something much larger? Well, I, I think it's, it's a little bit of both. So if you're not, if you're not putting an emphasis on security, um, then the odds of you getting hacked are, are probably significantly higher. Um, but, but, you know, there is an element of, and, and we've dealt with this historically, um, of, you know, as a, as a vendor of the larger kind of enterprise companies and, and even smaller companies, once you kind of adhere to SOC 2 standards and you, and you adopt that and, you, and you're getting your SOC 2 audits and your SOC 2 reports and all of that sort of thing. Well, one of the requirements of that is any vendor that you use or you know other companies, you have to meet their security standards. And so if if you're not doing that, it and and it's a it's a it's an arduous process and it's an expensive process to become SOC 2 compliant. Um, and so a lot of small companies out there are are gonna say, hey, you know, I'm gonna do what I can from a security standpoint, um, but I'm just not gonna go get this compliance certification and, and that sort of deal because of the resources it takes, because of the the changes to your organization. It's not just application security. It's not just email security or server security, those sorts of things. It, it, it's truly an, an, a, a framework of, of policies that need to be implemented company-wide and it, and it impacts every single individual within within your company. So I would assume that there is, I know that we had somewhat of a reluctance to do that until we really needed to. Um, but now that we've adopted those standards here, here at Shiplify, it's, it's, it's really a good thing, but it, it does have ramifications throughout your entire organization and that sort of thing. But if you're, if you're truly putting an emphasis on security, because it, it, it really does help and it, it's, in general, a good business decision, particularly if you want to be working with any sort of enterprise organizations and, and things like that, because they're going to have those requirements and standards as well. So the real question that I have for you was what is SOC 2? Like what you say SOC 2 compliant for, for, for some of us who aren't as hip into the data privacy scene, um, I don't know what that means. So <laughs> what does that mean? So it, SOC 2, it, it's, a, it's a framework for essentially security policies that you adopt. And so what it, what it stands for is security and compliance standards, and it's a, it's a type. And so there, there are two types of, of SOC 2 compliance. There's SOC 2 type 1 and then SOC 2 type 2. And SOC 2 type 1 essentially says, hey, we have, um, we have policies and procedures in place that detail our security at Shiplify or whatever your, your organization is. And those are written and documented and all of that sort of thing, right? And then SOC 2 type 2, essentially, you are paying a third-party audit company to come in and ensure that you are abiding by your own policies and procedures and standards that you have published as part of your SOC 2 type 1. And that's ultimately kind of what it is. And that, that covers a lot of what are you doing from a data privacy standpoint? What, how is your application locked down? All of those kinds of things. But also, are you documenting um, granting user access to, to different pieces of software, you know, do, do only the people who need access to something have access to that? You know, are you monitoring some of your email, like those kinds of things, all of that kind of gets laid out. And, and I'm not the security person here at Shiplify, you know, but I have to, you know, I have to adhere to all of these standards and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, but in general, in a nutshell, that's kind of what SOC 2 is. It's just a compliant, like a security and compliance standard um, where you basically put these policies and procedures in place organization wide, and then you have to document that you are in fact doing what you say you do. And then somebody comes in and audits that. And then they, they 
publish a report that anybody that's looking to work with you can request that report and they show their findings in that report. I did not even know that you could, as someone that would potentially be working with you as a vendor or a partner, that that was even a report that was available. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, I did not know what that was, but it's kind of like the generally accepted accounting principles and, you know, the sort like being socks, like the Sorbanes-Oxley Act requirement re were compliant on the accounting side of things. Um, it's good to know that there's something on the data side of things. We all learned something new today. And to, for me, that was it. Um, and that does seem very intimidating. Like, it's nice to say like, oh, if I want to know how to do some data privacy, I can just go and look at kind of more or less the checklist that they have. Um, and then also if I'm working with someone that says they are this SOX 2 compliant, that I can go get a report on how well, they passed their last audit. Um, because if there's anything that I've learned is that those of those auditors are quite thorough in everything that they do, and they're not going to let little things slide. <laughs> yep. Our, uh, our, our security guy calls it death by a thousand screenshots. He's like, I just have to take screenshots of everything that we've documented and, you know, all of that sort of thing. So, um, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, I hope that the next audit there is maybe only death by 999 screenshots instead of a thousand. Um, but that does bring us to kind of the end of the episode. But North, just like everyone else that comes on this show, there's one question that you have to answer and it could potentially be the hardest question you've been asked all day. Are you ready for it? Oh, I was born ready. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Absolutely not. A hot dog is a hot dog. Would you ever, let me ask you this. Would you ever have a sandwich eating competition on July 4th? I mean, potentially, but it would be like sliders. It wouldn't be hot dogs, you know? We, so we're based here in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's, you know, this famous restaurant called the Varsity. And for, I think the last six years, we've been, hosting an, an annual hot dog eating competition and we go over to the varsity and get, I don't know, maybe 75 hot dogs and all of our participants line up. We have, we have the walk up songs, you know, people are wearing the red, white, and blue, all of that. And it is every bit as disgusting and delicious as you would imagine. And that is, so my stance on it, it I'm a firm believer that a hot dog is not a sandwich. I am also team hot dogs, not a sandwich because it's a hot dog. And one of the best arguments I've heard is that if you ask someone to go make you a sandwich and they bring you a hot dog, you're going to be a little disappointed. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I would ever be disappointed with a hot dog. I mean, the Costco hot dogs are elite and we can just, we can, we can just call that. Yeah. Now, now I might have to go over to Costco right after this and grab a hot dog. Hey, I just had one last week that I 10 out of 10 recommend. I might get two. I don't know. <laughs> All right, North, if someone wants to reach out to you about potentially where the best hot dogs in Atlanta are or anything on data privacy and, you know, making sure that you're working with a reliable partner, where can they find you outside the show? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I've, I look at it every, every now and then. It's probably not the best way to get in touch <laughs> with me. Uh, but if... Uh, if you if you really want to get in touch with me directly, uh, you can email me at northw at shiplify.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thanks, Mary. This was a blast. You can find Chat Called the Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to check out all the other incredible FreightWaves shows. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Chat Call. See you on the internet.